so great to see so many familiar faces today. And so even more exciting to see so many new faces. We appreciate and respect the partnership and collaboration with all of you, helping us change lives every day. Welcome to our eighth National SPECT Partner Symposium. I see Dr. Donna Ficaro on here, who was our very first SPECT Partner Symposium speaker when we started this program on March 9th of 2022. My name is Marla Owens, and I am the Clinical Outreach Manager of our Chicago location. We have several of our Amen Clinic's physicians and team members from across the country participating on this call as well. During this event, you will have the opportunity to learn how and why clinicians are utilizing SPECT imaging and the benefits of SPECT imaging for you and your patients. And why would you want to use SPECT? As Dr. Raymond always says, how do you know unless you look? Some housekeeping. Please keep yourself muted during the presentation. The chat feature will be open for the entire event. And at the end, there will be time for a live question and answer session. I now have the honor and privilege to introduce the founder and CEO of MD Lifespan based here in Chicago. Dr. Ball Savage is a longevity expert who will be sharing the latest game-changing therapy option called Therapeutic Plasma Exchange. Dr. Savage has been utilizing SPECT images for many years and is going to discuss his techniques and how he utilizes SPECT imaging into his diagnostic approach to determine treatments and also how he can reverse the biomarkers of aging. With that said, Dr. Paul Savage, it's all you. Welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this uh, symposium uh, with Amen Clinic and uh, Daniel, who I've known for about 25 years. For those of you who don't know me, um, I've been in the age anti-aging longevity realm since uh, the late 1990s, um, actually having built such companies and founded such companies as Body Logic MD, uh, Power to Practice, which is the integrative EMR for our industry, uh, Forum Health, and now most recently, MD Lifespan. Uh, I've worked with Marla and the Amen Clinic for over two decades now, and I have found that SPEC uh, imaging studies to be critical in the care of my patients. Because as a longevity doctor, uh, I think sometimes people think, oh, you're the guys who give hormones and you're the guys who give supplements and maybe some stem cells. But in actuality, anti-aging and longevity medicine is really about optimizing people's health. And that includes getting them out of holes, either they come in to see you with or they incur during their time uh, with you as a physician. So the spec scan is an essential tool to our clinic because as Marley did say, and it's very true, you don't know if you don't look. And we found that spec scans have helped us differentiate toxicities from, from uh, chemicals, from injuries, and all these different various ways that the brain can present with pathologies that are really physiologic in the body or some type of trauma that the brain itself has incurred. So after um, having built the software in Form Health, I actually retired um, in August of 2022, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we purchased a place down in Brazil. And three weeks later, a landmark study was given to me to review. And this had to do with what was known as young blood theory. If many people may not be familiar, but since 2005, a pair of Stanford PhDs were studying longevity. And what they did was they took an old, gray, obese mouse with a human equivalent age of 70 and literally tied, surgically tied the circulation to a young, lean, healthy mouse. And within a month, the old mouse reverted its age physiologically by about 15 to 20 years. It actually got down to about 50 years old as a human equivalent. Uh, the young mouse experienced some aging effects, but really nothing to be very much pronounced. And that kind of spurred all this young blood theory where people are like, oh, there's something in the young mouse that they're giving to, that's being given to the old mouse that's making the old mouse young. And 
For seven years, the Stanford group and practically everybody around the um, globe started doing this study and started looking for that particle. What is that chemical? What is that protein that the young mouse is giving to the old mouse to make the old mouse young? Seven years later, the answer was nobody had an answer. A very smart PhD, um, he's kind of a little wisecracker actually, but uh, he was at a convention once and he just got up to, on stage and, and there was a question and answer and just basically said, um, you're looking at the wrong mouse. It's not what's in the young mouse that's making the old mouse young. It's what's in the old mouse that's making the old mouse old. And that became part of what's called um, parabiotic chrom chrom uh, uh, chromohedatosis. Um, so um, at that point, the researchers, the convoys from Stanford decided, you know what we'll do? We'll take the plasma out of the old mouse and give it back albumin. Now, this is a procedure that's been done in medicine since 1978, 1980. I remember doing it in the emergency room when I was the director of one of the largest trauma centers in the country on the night shift. Um, and we would do it for young women who came in with digitalis overdose. So we would do it on our sickle cellars. And what we noticed during those points is that um, it pretty reversed these things pretty quickly. So that's essentially what they did to the old mouse and the old mouse got young because they just took out the plasma, 70% of it, and gave back albumin. About 10 years later now, someone finally went ahead. It was the same researchers, the convoys, along with a apheresis doctor, Dr. Kiproff, took six older patients, and they did the same thing with them with the plasma exchange, and they also reversed the biomarkers of aging. When I saw that study, I realized that they had accomplished something that I don't think they knew what they had done, which is reverse of the toxicology of the microenvironment. And I have been in the world of longevity a big proponent of the fact that many of the things that we're seeing as we age is the effect of debris, of toxins that build up over time, including Alzheimer's. So because of all this, I came back and started MD Lifespan. We, um, did everything, got our certifications for the plasma exchange, put the protocol together with some of my smartest friends from all over the globe, and we started instituting these things on people to see exactly how much we could change their biomarkers of aging, and we're going to share some of that information with you now. What we're talking about today in the world of longevity is Alzheimer's, and we're going to get into that discussion even more right now because what we're talking about here is Amen Clinic, spec scans, longevity, and Alzheimer's. So that kind of is the synopsis of slide number two. So what is longevity? Longevity medicine is really in a field of medicine that's been emerging since the late 1990s with the aim of looking as, at disease as, or as aging as a disease. It's not, it is natural. I mean, aging is natural, but getting old is not healthy. So when you start looking at aging as an unhealthy aspect, then you can start asking yourself, what's changing in these various areas? And through our research, we've found identified 12 different areas uh, that people start to degrade in, and the brain is one of those for certain. So the aims of longevity medicine is always about improving the life, the life span or the health span for individuals, because you want to improve the quality of life also. When you're really looking at longevity medicine, you're not just talking about what you can do with the way of hormones and nutrition, um, but, which is what we call integrative interventions. But you're also looking at what you can do for early detection, because there is an ad addict that in, um, in medicine that's very true is it's easier to retain what you have than to regain what you've lost. So if Alzheimer's is an immuno, uh, uh, immune system engagement of a toxin where the brain is the area of the battlefield and the neurons are getting damaged by this interaction between the immune system and its enemy or enemies, then let's go look at what these enemies are and how we can avoid these things. That's part of the pertinent preventions. So when Forbes studied about 2,000 individuals last year and asked them what they, what they worried about the most, what they care most about aging, and it's pretty simple, what people fear the most is declining health, but they were very specific about the declining health. What they really worried about was more mobility issues, cancer, and cognitive decline. If you look at those three things and ask what do they have in common, 
they all have in common one thing, losing their independence. So really, what longevity is, is maintaining a person's independence over their lifetime. So I'm going to briefly review Alzheimer's. It's always good to remind yourself that this is a very dangerous disease. It's fatal. It's the most common cause of dementia. Over 6.2 million people have it currently in the United States. And that doesn't even count the number of people that are their healthcare givers that are involved in this whole thing, which you know increases that number to almost 40 million. It accounts for almost 80% of all dementia cases. And as I mentioned to you, it's fatal. It's progressive and it's chronic. So as you get older, your odds of getting Alzheimer's increases to the point where if you hit 90, a third of your friends are going to have Alzheimer's at that time. And that may also include you. What do we do to work up Alzheimer's? Well, Alzheimer's and any of the cognitive decline we see in the office, and we, we just look for these things early. I'm looking for these things in, in their early 40s and early 50s. I'm not waiting till people hit 60 and 70 because you need to catch these things early. And having a great medical history is paramount. Now, many of the people out there have heard me lecture before. I'm a mathematician. I'm a computer expert. That's my background. That's my master's. But it's numbers. And the numbers matter. And the data matters. So look at the medical history. Find out what their family history is. Find out what their social history is. Find out what their physical activities are. Find out all the different things that start adding up to them being at risk for Alzheimer's. Do a thorough physical and neural exam every year. Looking for, you know, I, I'd say I'm looking at a neural exam every time I watch my patient walk down the hall because that's balance and that's watching them shuffle or that's watching their facial, you know, do they have any facial expression? Uh, has it changed over time? And doing mental status tests is a must. You cannot just assume because they're answering your questions well that they're cognitively sound. That's not true. A lot of people can fabulate. A lot of people can get through a mental status test by just saying things. And you're like, that sounds reasonable. It's not. And finally, the gold is always in the lab and diagnostic tests. Although we all know there's no gold standard for Alzheimer's, there is many different tests out there that will certainly make you start considering that as a diagnosis. But also, what's very important is also to know what it's not. Because there are a lot of things out there, and I mean a lot of things. I see people with Alzheimer's, and maybe I might be right one out of three times. The other times, it's something else. You have to look for these things, and you have to look for these things thoroughly. That includes an MRI or CT to rule out uh, you know, any type of mass effect, any type of bleeding, any type of shit, uh, ventri ventricular hypertrophy, but also a PET scan to look, or a SPECT scan to look at the uptake of nutrients to see functionally what the brain's doing. I remember when I first got into integrative medicine back in the late 1990s and hearing Daniel talk, and as an ER doctor, having people come into the emergency room with chronic fatigue and always going, what are you doing in my emergency room? You know, you're a malingerer. This is not a real disease. Get out of the emergency room. Go home. See a psychiatrist. And in one of the presentations, Dr. Amen showed me a spec scan of somebody with chronic fatigue. I was appalled. It was tox a toxic brain with all the little uh, craters and all the, I was like, there's no possible way that person can be healthy with that type of pathology. And that actually, for one of the first times ever, woke me up to realize there's more out there in medicine than we were taught about in medical school. Cognitive assessment. It doesn't matter how you do it, but do a test that is well vetted. Do a test that is reproducible. Do a test that can be measured. So one of my favorites is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. This is a very simple test. I give people a um, clipboard, pencil and paper, or they can do this at home and send me a picture of it on their phone. And it's very easy for them to do and to assess and it's easy for us to score. And you can watch these scores over the years. People don't suddenly drop off quickly. I always say it's kind of like a PSA test for prostate cancer. If it goes up fast, it's not cancer. It's going to be prostatitis. If it goes up this slow, gradual climb, now we probably got cancer. Same thing with cognitive assessments. If it goes down fast, it's probably not Alzheimer's. It's probably something acutely wrong, a virus, a uh, infection, um, and if you go from a year to another year and you're dropping 10, 15 points, 
you're looking for something other than Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's are the patients that come in and over a pattern of three to five years, you start seeing a point down every year. They go from 30, then 28, then 27, then 26. And when they finally reach a certain point, they'll drop quickly. But you see this progressive decline coming years on a cognitive assessment test before. This is very true. We've known this in medicine for a very long time, that had patients been cognitively tested for a decade before their physical symptoms started showing up, they would have been diagnosed on a much faster time scale. One of the things that we do is we do a lot of labs um, because Alzheimer's is precipitated by a lot of different things. I'm going to still stick with the uh, position that Alzheimer's is an immune system attack on a pathogen, a toxin in the brain. Does, there's a number of them that, that can happen. And the neurons are like the trees in the forest that just get damaged in the battle. So when I do blood tests from LabCorp, for example, I'm looking at their cholesterol, not necessarily to see what their cholesterol is, but to see what their triglycerides are, to see what their small, dense particles are. Because the small, dense particles of the cholesterol become small and dense because of they're acted upon by inflammation, oxidation, or glycation. And that's what makes them into small, dense particles. And that leads you to know that you have a patient at higher risk for Alzheimer's because oxidation, inflammation, and glycation, as we all know, are the hallmarks of everything bad that's going to happen to you in life. You need to look at the, um, uh, the, the CMP, the SMAP, because you have to see what their kidneys are doing. What are their liver doing? Uh, what are their electrolytes doing? What does their sugar look like? Thyroid testing is obvious. People hypothyroid act cognitively slow. Female hormones are essential because women who have normal levels of estrogen have lower rates of Alzheimer's over time. Um, and plus testosterone is a huge anti-Alzheimer's hormone for women. It helps maintain their strength, both their emotional, their mental, their spiritual, as well as their sexual health. So when we also look at the immune system, I've always been asked many times, you know, if you get one system to look at what you're going to look at, and I remember thinking it was always hormones, they'll show you the answers with the cortisol, and then there was the gut because the microbiome has all the secrets of the universe, and then there's the heart uh, because the heart has uh, so many different functions of electrical, man. but in actuality, after about 30 years in this field, I'll take an immune system panel over almost anything because when you start understanding the full panel, and I'm not talking about a CBC, I'm talking about T cell, B cells, and natural killer cell assessment. You get to start to see the CD3s, which are uh, all the total number of T cells, and the CD4s, which are the Marines, which help the B cells out when they're attacking an enemy. And then you get to look at the T8 cell, uh, CD8 cells, which are the T cells, uh, suppressor cells, which are the army guys who go out and battle everybody else. And you get to look at the B cells, which are like the battleships that shoot missiles at all the pathogens. And you get to look at the natural killer cells, which are a subgroup of the T cells, which are highly trained to take out things that have been in our universe for millenniums. And you really start to see how these play with each other. And you start to see how areas become depleted by infections, depleted by allergens, depleted by toxins, immunosuppressants. It really gives you a great idea of looking at a system and saying, something's going crazy here. And it actually points you in the direction because subclass IgGs are the same things. Those are the missiles that the B cells are shooting. And you can look at those at, with the different subclass patterns and see, is it depressed? Is it elevated? Are we at war? Is it being, is it being suppressed? And start to figure out where you are in the process of disease patterns. Uh, complement factors, C3A and C4A are now becoming even more popular with the a diagnosis of long COVID because it activates the complement uh, system. Everything activates the complement system that's infectious, especially viral. And these are good numbers to kind of tee you up to go down the viral path, look down that area. Veg, the um, vascular endothelial growth factor, that's a great one to look at because so many of the um, bacterium and like Lyme, like Babesia, they hide in the vascular lining and it causes the vascular endothin growth factor to elevate. So you now you know what you're looking at and maybe where. Uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha and uh, interleukin-6 are great cytokines. So you can see is there a battle going on? Uh, myeloperoxidase or TMAO are both oxidative factors. So you can see is oxidation going on. So this kind of panel, you're starting to get a real good play. And this is the panel I do for everybody I'm on Alzheimer's workup because I want to know what systems are engaged. Now, it doesn't end there. You have to go on and you have to start looking at nutrients. And we'll get into that because B vitamin deficiencies, antioxidant deficiencies, 
inflammatory deficiencies, those are all related to different various things that could be going on besides Alzheimer's or that could be going on to fuel the Alzheimer's or could actually be going on to cause the Alzheimer's. So knowing and understanding a nutritional evaluation, one of my favorites is Nutrivel from a, a Genova. I also like Spectrocell because both of these tests don't depend on a venous level of blood um, for the nutrition. That's kind of stupid when you start thinking that the vein carries the blood that's coming back from the cells after everything's been depleted and all the garbage has been uploaded. And then we're looking at to try to figure out what the values of the nutrients are. That doesn't make any sense in any kind of model in my mind. But a Nutrivel looks at the functional deficiencies by looking at enzymatic rates, and the spectra cell actually looks at intercellular nutri nutrient rates. So in both my opinion, those are both much better tests, and I've used Genova for 20 years. Nice thing about Genova Nutrivel is reproducible, and when you fix the nutrient deficiencies, your test reflects that, which doesn't always happen with the, with the venous blood test. Finally, we go on to start getting into the, the toxins. Now, toxins can come in various forms. They can be alive, like viruses and Lyme and bacteria. Remember, we have endotoxins and we have all these other mycotoxins. These are things that are alive, uh, what I consider to be living things. They're reproducible. They actually reproduce. So even if you can get rid of them, they will come back if you don't get all of them. And then you have the inorganic toxins, the heavy metals, the pesticides, the herbicides, the phthalates the um, uh, phenols, the volatile chemicals. And that part is one of my main focus of interest in the last few years, because that number has gotten incredibly high in just a very short period of time. We're looking at areas where back in the 1980s, we would not detect any type of uh, toxins. And now there's 83,000 toxins available in the United States, of which I test 120. These are very dangerous things. I don't know if you watched the news uh, reel yesterday, but CBC, uh, the CDC just announced that they believe every physician should check patients for forever chemicals, the PFAs, the, fluorid, the fluoridated compound, because of the intense probability that they're going to be causing disease, Alzheimer's, neurologic, cancer, you name it, these do it. But that doesn't leave out all the other ones. I mean, the pesticides, uh, glyphosate, which is the number one herbicide in the United States and the number one thing that we see in Chicago and all of our patients. So you need to be looking at the infections and you need to be looking at the toxins. I like the Vibrant Wellness TIC 2.0 because it gives me about 50 different variants of viruses and bacteriums and, and uh, Lyme and all the different subspecies of Lyme. And it gives me a very good idea of what the immune system is doing actively in all those different areas. And then you have the, the toxins and the toxin burden I like from um, Vibrant America, they test for mycotoxins, they test for heavy metals, they test for all the environmental toxins, and then you can actually add in the PFA testing, which I recommend everybody does. It's a relatively inexpensive test at like $650. It's easy to do at home. It takes a couple of weeks to come back and it's just filled with information. Now, a lot of times in the past 10 years, when you're looking at integrated longevity medicine, I've been able to do a lot with the nutrition and the exercise, stress management, sleep, but the intoxication, that was always been a, a little bit of a heartache because we know that chelation only takes out a couple of the heavy metals, lead, mercury, uh, cadmium, pretty well. Uh, all the other ones, not so well. We know that binders take out all the molds, you know, ochre toxin, uh, some of the, uh, the Zen or some of the other uh, citronin takes out those fairly well, but all the other ones, maybe not so well. Um, then we have charcoal, we have sand, and we have infrared saunas, and we have all these different ways of getting these toxins out of people. But we kind of resign ourselves to telling people, this is what you do to keep it from getting in you, because even the United States Navy has admitted there's not a lot of good ways to get these toxins out of people. Well, not to probably most recently. And finally, imaging studies requires an MRI with and without contrast. You need to find out what the vasculature is doing. You need to make sure there's no uh, enhancing lesions. And you need to do a spec scan to see which areas of the brain are functioning. Remember, we'll get into this a little bit further. MRI show structure, spec shows function. Completely different aspects, two different windows. What are spec scans? Well, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because we're all spec experts here, but this is what we give to our patients to let them know that this is a radioactive isotope that we're going to be inserting through an IV. And I always do resting and concentration studies on the first time through. Matter of fact, 
almost always do it on every time through, uh, even on follow-ups, because I want to see how these things change over time. Unless one of my um, spec colleagues uh, in Chicago called me up and said, now we just need to do one. Okay, great. But really, we're just we're using a radioactive uh, tracer on some sugar that circulates through the body. And as the brain is at rest or thinking, it perfuses that part of those neurons of the brain that are then working. And we get a 3D image we call the spec scan. <clears throat> spec scans tell us a lot. It can tell us if something is a memory issue or dementia and what kind of dementia. It can tell us if there's areas that look like they've had strokes or there are areas that look like they're is an uptake in activity with seizures, or an area which is hyperperfusing with the activity or underperfusing, which may be a space occupying tumor, or areas that just aren't lighting up, which may or may in certain areas of the brain, as we all know, traumatic brain injury, which is incredibly common on everybody who's 60 years old. Uh, schizophrenia, luckily I don't see a lot of that. ADD, I see a lot of that when they uptick on their diamond pattern, depression and anxiety. Here's something that you get from an ER doctor and a guy who's been a doctor for 40 years. The vast majority of depression and anxiety are physiologic. You got something going on in the body that the brain doesn't like, and you're heating up the brain. It's not working well. I'm not saying I'm opposed to um, SSRIs and antidepressants. I use them because sometimes I need to get the short solution fixed to be able to get the long solution underway. But it is always, I find there's something else in the body it's an infection or it's an inflammation. Then you got to start going through this whole detect workup, which is not too difficult when you get all this information given to you. And then finally, substance abuse. I've been in recovery for 20 years. And let me tell you something. We have me, my spec scans from before and now. They're so much better and so much more improved. So many of our clients have substance abuse. It is going up and not just in the fentanyl area, but in the alcoholism and in the, uh, in the amphetamines also, because everybody needs more focus and they need more relief. So Let's not just get into the fentanyl area and worry about all these people that that's exacerbating on. Substance abuse is a part of 25% of your patient's lifestyle in some fashion. Spec, spec scans can be used to differentiate, and I use these as a differential. I use spec scans a lot as a differential. I can tell there's something with this patient. Um, there's inflammation going on, or there's a toxin going on, or we have something going on physically in their body. And I do a spec scan to see what it tells me is going on in the brain because they're going to mirror each other. So each one of the types of dementia has a distinct blood flow uh, that's that can be patterned on spec and on PET scan. So spec scan comes in very important, not just in the dementia area, but in very many different areas. I remember one case I had a patient who was heavy metal toxic and we ended up getting the spec scan. It was so damaging, so damning that the patient realized probably for the first time ever, this is a problem and we need to take care of it because before they were like, I'm kind of half in, I'm kind of doing the things. I know it's important to get it out. You Now you show them their brain and they're like, dude, let's get this out. And that's, I think, one of the gold things that I find always about spec scan because if you have anything going on with their patient, their spec scan is not going to be normal. It's the real healthy people. They're going to have healthy spec scans. And you can return people to healthy and see their spec scans follow, follow suit as well. But using spec scan and PETs as a biomarker of aging is brilliant. And Daniel's been talking, Dr. Amon's been talking about that for years, because you can see progressive changes in the brain over time that are considerable relationship to aging and dementia. Even with mild cognitive impairment, you start to see some of these changes. And the case presentation I'm gonna share with everybody, that I'm giving a little foreshadowing, that's exactly what we had going on. Spec scans are amazing. They show areas of reduced brain flow in areas that aren't working for whatever the reason may be. And in the Alzheimer's place, as we all know, it's the old thumbs in the ears, hands on the head distribution that we see around this area with the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe, but it also is the cerebellum as well. Therapeutic plasma change. Now, I don't know anybody who's in the industry that hasn't heard at least the word TPE or therapeutic plasma change. It's been very popular in uh, longevity medicine and integrated medicine for a couple of years and become increasingly so. Uh, I have found this in my 40 years as a doctor to be one of the biggest game changers that we have in medicine that's been sitting over at the side for the last 50 years. Let's go put it to work, shall we? What is therapeutic plasma change? Well, it's basically a procedure 
where we put an IV in a patient that is the draw line, and it's like a plasma donation. The blood comes out, goes into a machine. The machine spins it, separates it into the blood cells, separates it into the plasma. We keep the plasma. We give the blood cells back to the patient with saline and albumin so that the patient can maintain the vascular space. But then we take all the plasma and we throw it away. How much plasma do we take out? We take out about 70% of a patient's plasma. That's what's called a um, estimated plasma volume. 1.0. That's about 72% of the plasma. So if you're a regular woman or man and you have six liters of blood, it's usually about more like seven, but let's say it's six, then you're going to be on a guy, it's about half of the plasma. And on a woman, it's about 60% of it is plasma. And of that 50 or 60% of the blood that's plasma, we're taking 70% of that. So we're going to be somewhere right around three, three and a half liters of plasma each exchange. And we're giving back three, three and a half liters of saline and albumin. So it's a one-on-one -on -one exchange. MD Lifespan. We're the white glove high level service for longevity for patients interested in optimizing their health. We are now offering therapeutic plasma exchange or TPE. This revolutionary new procedure, which has been around for 50 years has now been discovered to reverse all the biomarkers of aging and therapeutic plasma exchange is a very simple and safe procedure done right here in our office. On the day of the procedure of the TPE, patients present to the office, we ask them to be well rested, wearing loose fitting clothes, having eaten before the procedure and being accompanied by a loved one. During the procedure, you'll have an IV inserted into each arm. From one IV, the blood comes out, goes into the machine that we call a cell separator, it separates the plasma from the blood cells, then the blood cells are reconstituted with a nutrient solution of saline and albumin and given back to the patient. This procedure is very safe. There are some side effects that patients may experience which are minor, such as numbness of the lips, arms, and legs, and that comes from the anticoagulant that we use to keep the blood cells from sticking together. Patients could also get lightheaded from the procedure itself because we are exchanging fluids or from the fact of being poked with needles because let's be serious, nobody likes needles. Other than that though, this procedure has the same safety profile as that of a regular IV. At MD Lifespan, patient co comfort is paramount and each patient can choose their environment that they wish to have this procedure done. They can choose the business suite, which we allow you to hook to our internet and conduct your business while you're there for the time period or you can connect to our meditation suite with soothing music and visuals. Or if you'd like, you can have the entertainment suite, that's my favorite, and select from the thousands of movies and television shows that we have on file. The procedure for TPE takes about 90 minutes for the procedure to be concluded, but you'll be in the office for about three hours as we get the IV set up on the front end and we're checking you out on the back end. So most patients should think to be here about three hours. I came into a lovely office and I was met by some wonderful people at the front desk. They took me back into a very comfortable room, started giving me set up and everything, and they used numbing medicine, so, because I don't like those pokes, and that was very comfortable for me. I am 60 years old. I want to stay a young 60. I have three grandchildren, and I want to be there for the rest of their lives. To get an appointment for therapeutic plasma exchange, call our number. Speak to one of our patient service advisors. They're very knowledgeable and experienced staff that will help you determine, is this procedure right for you? And if so, which program? Actually, you could see that it's a very safe and simple procedure. What I was talking about with the TPE is we've done hundreds of them in the last year here in the office in Chicago. And at first, you know, I'm a, I'm a very pro-patient safety doctor. Um, so I was here for the first hundred. and we went through all of them and what we found out after all these plasma chains that we did is they're very safe and they're very effective. You need to just watch out for some very simple things. Since you're taking all the 70% of the plasma out of a person, it's very important that they eat before they come in and during the procedure because you don't want their blood sugar to drop. Hypoglycemia occurs. You also want to make sure that you give them thumbs beforehand because as the blood comes out of their body, it's mixed with citrate, and citrate binds calcium, and calcium, without the calcium, the clotting 
uh, cascade cannot work. So the blood transfuses through the whole machine without a problem, very slippery, very easy to do. But as it comes back into the patient, it's low calcium and that and the citrate then can give this patient an allergic reaction. It looks like hives, um, presents like hives, but it's not the anaphylactic hives. They do itch a little bit, um, but they don't have trouble with their respiration. Their heart rate doesn't go up, their blood pressure doesn't drop. It's easily reversible by just giving them more tums to chew orally or by giving them some calcium in their IV. And then finally, uh, you can get some hypovolemia as the fluids are shifting, but everything responds about 250 Cs of uh, saline. So we've been very thrilled with this procedure in the office. Um, we are very comfortable with having it. Uh, my nurses run the whole procedure, um, and it usually takes about two hours the whole to do the procedure, about four hours from the beginning to end and getting them all hooked up. So how does TPE differ from, let's say, dialysis? Great question. Plasma exchange takes out all the plasma and everything in it. So I'm taking out nutrients, I'm taking out hormones, I'm taking out uh, waste products, toxins, heavy metals, immune complexes, everything. If it's in the plasma, I'm taking it out and replacing it with clear saline and albumin. Now, within about 48 hours, the body's going to generate its own new fresh plasma, which is why the government lets you donate plasma twice a week, because it just takes hours for you to replace that plasma. So what this plasma that they're getting back is fresh. It's new. It's non-toxic. It's non-inflamed. It's non-oxidized. It has nothing in it. And your body puts more proteins in it and more and hormones back into it. So you're basically giving them back baby fresh plasma that they generate themselves. Whereas dialysis is just has a semipermeable membrane that only the smallest of waste particles can flow between. So you're looking at only urea, creatinine, and some of the other very microsoft toxins. So the difference between TP and dialysis, TPA takes out everything. Dialysis only takes out certain small waste products. The difference between plasma exchange and donation is just size. You go into a, a plasma center and give a donation of plasma, you're going to give about 500 to 750 cc's of plasma every time. Plasma exchange, you're right around three to three and a half liters every time. So that's why when we do plasma exchange, you have to give them back fluid. And you have to give them back about three liters, whereas plasma donation, you don't have to give them back anything. This is a study that I mentioned that came out in December 2022, and I actually had a little chance to look at the before while I was being reviewed. And this was a wonderful, amazing study done, done by Dr. Kiproff and the convoys out of Stanford. This is the one where they took the mice uh, and then they took the adults. And through the adults, they put them through five different plasma exchanges uh, over the course of five months. They measured 500 proteins on the front side and then whittled that down to 73 of those proteins that they called biomarkers of aging. And then they measured those same biomarkers uh, after the plasma change. Uh, and what they noticed was a significant drop in inflammation, oxidation, sciescent cells, cancer cells, as well as Alzheimer's markers, and a significant improvement in the immune system. This is where I realized what they had done is cleaned up the microenvironment. They had just adopted a way, part of the equation of what you needed to detoxify the uh, us adults as we get older and now the younger people because there's so much toxins in the universe. So we're gonna take one second here and we're gonna talk real briefly about the AMBAR study. This was as a um, plasma donation center called Grisfol and they came up with the idea of, hey, let's take this plasma change and let's take 500 patients from 14 different hospitals and do plasma changes on them once a week for six weeks giving them back possibly not only albumin, but a little IgG immunoglobulins and some of them, other ones, different concentrations of albumin. And then let's watch these patients over the next 14 months. And what they saw was amazing, that the real mild Alzheimer's cases out of those 500 um, had zero progression. 100% of the patient had zero progressions for 14 months. And in the moderately to severe groups of dementia on the Alzheimer's, they had 67% of the patients that demonstrated no discernible progression of their disease for 14 months. After 14 months, we start to see the disease engage again. This is part of the things I knew before I read the longevity study that made me realize this is what we're doing with plasma change on Alzheimer's is we're getting out the toxins, turning off the fight, the damage stops, the progression stops. Otherwise, Alzheimer's starts up again. So 
we need to start looking at the connection because we don't have a drug or a therapy in medicine that gives this kind of results to patients already in the progress of Alzheimer's. But if this is what it does with patients with Alzheimer's and it slows down the progression, can we slow down the progression of the onset of Alzheimer's as well? My bet is absolutely, definitively, yes. So we're going to talk about some of the things we've done at MD Lifespan. And again, I'm working with an international team of researchers and physicians, and we're looking at our protocol, and I'm going to share with you our preliminary data. Our protocol involves measuring over 150, now 200 biomarkers before treatment. Many of them are you're familiar with. Uh, many of them are toxins. And some of them you're not familiar with because I wasn't even familiar until our uh, biometrics and bioanalytic guy from France came forward with a whole panel of a whole bunch of ones that we're actually um, looking at on the blood sample. But what we're doing is we're essentially doing plasma exchanges, somewhere between three or five over the course of three or five months, once every four weeks, replacing with albumin and normal sanity. But we're also giving them IV therapies. Um, and we're also giving them oral nutrients every day. We also have selected a few medications that they take, a peptide that they take, and the course is between four to six months of therapy, and let's get into the results. Our preliminary results have shown, and this is over 36 patients at this point, that 90 to 100% of aluminum, which is very much tied to, uh, to Alzheimer's, gallenium, tin, and tungsten are removed, and these numbers stay down at two months, they're still down. And even with our patients that we're now starting to get the information back at six months, we still see no increase in those heavy metals. Lead, nickel, uh, thorium, we see between 50 and 90% reduction in the heavy metal content via the urine test that we do do provocative testing so that we're helping to draw out any heavy metals they have. But let's make sure we understand that the provocative testing generally only pulls out more lead, mercury, and cadmium. Of the mercury, arsenic, and tellurium and uranium, believe it or not, we're seeing a lot of that in our patients, 25 to 50% of those heavy metals are removed with this simple and safe procedure. When we start looking at the environmental toxins, we start seeing 60% decrease in herbicide. In Chicago, gly glyphosate, which is Roundup, is the number one toxin with a bullet in the Chicagoland area. 70% of our patients have this, and of those 70%, 80% of those, it's in the high critical range. That means by the NHANES values, and we only go by the government values, even though everybody knows those values are too high, those are the ones we've chosen to use. We're seeing patients in Chicago, at least 50% of the people that we've tested, and these are healthy people, in essence, have glyphosate levels in high critical ranges. We see a lot of wax in patients from all the vegetables that get sprayed, which are problematic for the GI tract. And then the pesticides, which to be serious, if it's going to kill an herb and it's going to kill a pest, it's going to kill you. So to think these things are safe, because they're just a micro doses, is insane. Plus, we're not looking at just one chemical. So they're always like, this chemical by itself. No, we're looking at all 83,000 chemicals together. It doesn't take, it just takes a little of each of them add up to one big problem. And then the biphenylate, which is also one of the higher toxins in the Chicagoland area, along with lead, mercury, and arsenic of the top five. Biphenylate is in 35% of people, or we have 35% reduction on average and a 66% reduction in pesticides. And finally, on a lot of different, we have various numbers of biomarkers of aging. We're seeing oxidation down 75%, cyacin cancer cells down 66%, inflammation, this whole thing about chronic inflammation or inflammation is caused by toxins and it's down by 40 to 60%. NAD, the nutrient, nicotinic, is up by 50%. The immune system is up between 50 and 100%, but on average, we we uh, opted to say 15% because we put everybody together and the glycated sugars down by 15% as well as the cholesterols are down between 15 and 25% without therapy, just simply because when you move the toxins, cholesterol is a binder that does, the body doesn't need it anymore. It goes down as well as sex hormone binding globulin, another binder goes down. So you see all these people with high sex, sex hormone globulin and you're wondering what's going on here. It's binding something and that something's probably a toxin. Let's talk about a patient. This is my patient, and she's been one of my favorite patients, Amy. She's 62-year-old, essentially healthy, 
She presents because she wanted to live long. And her main problem is she's noticed over the last couple of years that she starts having some memory and cognitive complaints, not remembering people's names, knowing she should know those. She thought it might be due to her wine consumption. She cut it out. And so when she presented with me, it was six months without any alcohol, and she still had quite a bit of this cognitive function. She denied ever having a head injury, and she was not on hormones for menopause, but she took Prevagen and CoQ10 to try to help her. And those were her only um, supplements. Her mom had severe Alzheimer's, died of Alzheimer's, and she's concerned that she's going to become her mom. We gave her the Montreal, the MCA, and she scored a 24, which is not normal for a, for a woman 62 years old. They usually 35, or I mean, they're usually uh, 26, 27, 28, 29, even 30. Women do very well, um, but we do start seeing them in cognitive decline um, in, in 65 and 75 years of age in general. I'm, I'm looking at whole populations. But it's just 24 worried me on her, especially since she hadn't been drinking for six months. On the lab core test, her APOE was 3 4. So I explained to her that put her at a somewhat increased risk, but her thyroid was ruled out. Her cholesterol and small particles were ruled out. Her liver and kidney were ruled out. Uh, her female hormones were all low. Uh, her DHA and cortisol were low. Uh, she also had had COVID uh, six months before. So there was some question about whether she had a little long COVID because her cortisol, DHA, her tumor necrosis factor, and her IL-6 were all low. So we did approach her also as having possibly some long COVID some, uh, symptoms going on here, but she did not have the necessary fatigue. But we did notice on her um, immune system workup that her B cells were pretty low at 112. They should be about 2 to 50. So they were pretty substantial low, as well as her uh, CD4s, which are usually around 90, 950. Remember, these are the Marines that help out the battleships. And so those were also a little bit low as well. Uh, but her complement factors were normal. Her inflammation was not high, but her oxidation was high. She had a lot of MPO. Uh, MPO is the oxidative marker that usually is elevated if your oxidant is inside the body. TMAO is an oxidative marker that is typically elevated if it's inside the gut. So if you have a TMO is high and the TPO is high, you're probably looking at an oxidative gut issue that's getting into a person. But if your TMO is high, MPO is low, then you're probably looking at an isolated uh, uh, SIBO. And if you're looking at MPO is high, but TMO is low, then you're probably looking at an internal oxidant. I'm going to guess for an infection or a toxic metal every day of the week. Nutrient testing is critical on these patients. Um, B deficiencies have been associated with cognitive decline, especially B9 and B12. But we also know that uh, there's a lot of anti, a lot of accidents um, and inflammation that also cause cognitive decline. So there are a lot of the things that you can do on nutrient testing because you're starting to see low glutathione, high uh, lipid peroxidases, that may, and uh, high taurines. That makes you start thinking we have an we have an accident going on here, or you start looking at all the oils and the you know, the um, the different the three six nine, um, and you start seeing that those are imbalanced. So you know you have an inflammatory process going on. You got to start working out that as well. But this is the toxin studies. Now, this is her summary of her toxins. Now, all in all, there's 109 toxins that we test in the Chicagoland area that we tested people six years ago. 80 percent of our people had at least one of these toxins. In the, in the high range, which is over 75% of NHANES. Three years ago, that was 90%. This past year, in 2023, we had zero patients that had no toxins. Matter of fact, the person who had the lowest had three. The person who had the highest had 30, with an average of 12 this year, where six years ago, it was only six. Three years ago, it was only eight. This year, it's 12 on average. And of those 12s, Six years ago, out of those six, one of them was high. Three years ago, out of eight, two of them were high. This year, out of 12, five of them are high. So we're increasing the amount, the quantity, and the danger of each of these chemicals in each person. Now, this patient had a lot of toxins. So you can see here, I think this is 14 on her, or 15 toxins. So she's much higher than average. But she also has about half of them, which are in the high critical range, including the ones that are associated with Alzheimer every day of the week, uh, mercury and lead and arsenic. Um, then you have the oxytoxins and you have DAS, which is also a carcinogen. Um, you have a lot of bad players here. Even the ones below, though, you can't rule them out because remember the, the uh, forever chemicals and the phthalates 
are significantly in the fact that they are highly toxic and we don't even know all the different damage that these things are doing. So that really poses us a question in longevity medicine of how do we get these things out? Because everybody agrees that we live in a toxic environment. Everybody agrees that they have some of their toxins in themselves and everybody agrees that at some point this is going to get them give them problems, but we've not found an effective way to get it out until now. Now, this also talks about mycotoxins causing Alzheimer's. BPA is associated with Alzheimer's. Arsenic, mercury, lead, and, and aluminum. Everything that can be a toxin that the brain could attack, the immune system could attack in the brain, is a cause of concern in Alzheimer's. Infectious diseases. We know that the Alzheimer's are related to Epstein-Barr. We know it's related to Lyme. We know it's related uh, to cytomegaly virus. So you have to do a toxin testing and a, a case study of infectious so you can start figuring out which one of these infections have they had in the past and are they still there? Remember, we have DNA viruses like Epstein-Barr, cytomegaly virus, parvovirus, all of them which are implicated, uh, herpes, all of them in, in, impl implicated in Alzheimer's. But we also have the residuals, the ones that recurrent like the strep and the Lyme, the Bartonella, the Babesia. And these can come and come again at different times unless you help eradicate them. And every time they come, they're going to give you more damage. Obviously, MRIs are very important for the uh, study of the brain um, because you have to rule out uh, ventricular, hyper or ventricular hypertension. You have to worry about hemorrhages. You have to make sure that there's, uh, are the sulci looking good? Obviously, in this one, you see a lot of deterioration of all the gray matter around there. And you do need to do a spec scan. And her spec scan, as shown here, showed some concern. What's really interesting, when you look at enough spec scans, they start to look a lot like the infectious and the toxic brain scans, just in different areas of progression. And we'll probably uh, draw in one of the couple of the AMEN people to make that, make that comment. I'd like to hear what they say, because I think it's a pattern. I think it's a spectrum of one end to the other. So what do we do for her? Well, we uh, I'm really a big fan of uh, Dr. Amon's uh, Bright Mind Memory Powder, uh, the omega-3s. We have also in quercetin as a strong antioxidant at a pretty high dose, the glutathione. Oh, she was getting both IV and orally. Uh, we also gave her exosomes um, to help clean up uh, her in internal um, and help repair some of the damage uh, that occurs internally. Uh, we gave her Ultra Binder for the mold. We gave her EDTA for the metals, but mostly what we did was we put her on our five arm protocol and she did that over four months, including all the meds, the proteins, the peptides and the nutrients. And we also did um, uh, if her breast, uh, her breast MRI uh, and lip, liquid biopsy were negative. They were, we started around estrogen, testosterone and uh, progesterone therapy. And we also treated her with some oligonucleotide, what's called antisense uh, therapy for her line. A year later, um, the patient was very pleased with her progress. Her, her Montreal cognitive score was 24, it went up to 28. She notably noticed a change in her mentation. Her female hormones were now within physiologic normal. Her CD19s had jumped about 50% in height. Her CD4s jumped about 25% in height. Everything's on the immune system started working better and looking normal. The oxidation on the MPO went down to went back down to normal. On her nutrient tests, her antioxidant support was high at eight, meaning you did not have a lot of support, down to two. Her inflammation was high at nine, went down to three. Her toxic exposure was eight, down to two. And on her heavy metal testings, her heavy metals, her mycotoxins, and all the environmental toxins were down between 20 and 90%. And that was at one year following the TPEs. So I want to say thanks to everybody. We're winding up here to one o'clock, so we have some time for some questions. I'm very happy to answer any questions. I'd like to thank everybody for having me come on here and share some of the things. I, I want to share one more slide before we go, but I want to let everybody know that health, healthy longevity depends on early detection. Look for cancer, look for Alzheimer's, do liquid biopsies, do specs, look, do calcium scans for heart disease, look at the blood often and deeply. Uh, Alzheimer's is a de devastating disease. I lost my grandmother, my mother, and my sister to that disease, and I'm very passionate about putting an end to it. Spec scans should be done early on everybody and repeated over periods of time as necessary. I am very cautious about giving too many people too many isotopes, but there is that risk that is offset by the early detection. Plasma exchange may highly likely be, and I got to say that, but I really am passionate about this, 
uh, this protocol that we put together, a way of preventing or at least slowing down the onset of Alzheimer's. We already know it slows down the progression. If you want to know more about TPE, then go to our website on info, um, download a free uh, uh, guidebook on a website, or you can go to this website, uh, info. Uh, email them at info.md.com, mdlifespan.com, and the clinics. For referrals, uh, patients can just go to our website. We have an online uh, calendar that they can make an appointment, and they will talk to me. I take all referrals of clients coming in, so you don't have to worry about them. The patient, asso patient service associate is me. Um, but if you want to get a hold of me, if you're a doctor or clinician, please do so by my private email, which is paul.savage.md at mdlifespan.com. Uh, you can get a hold of us by uh, calling 1-844-PLASMA-X, or you can send your patients who have very uh, differing uh, questions to our website. We have over 30, 350,000 words on that website, and a lot of it has to do about testing and solutions. So I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, it's been great. I know I talk fast. I know I go through a lot of information. It's a fire hose, but it's a big topic. And you guys are all proficient at aiming clinics. So I'm going to assume that a lot of the stuff I went to, you went, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that. And if you don't, the slides are available to you. And I'm always happy. We have references on all the slides. They'll, the references will be given to you because I'm one of those people that believes numbers don't lie and you better be able to quote your reference. Thanks, Marla. Dr. Savage, that was incredible. Just, I'm getting feedback um, from all of the participants and we thank you so much for your participation in this event today. So I wanna start with a few upfront questions that were proposed during the presentation. So we have a participant who wants to know the, the biggest difference between an MRI and a SPECT imaging scan. So MRI is gonna show you structure. So you're going to, an MRI is going to show you uh, deficits and the white matter uh, in the gray matter. It's going to show you uh, ventricular, ventricular size. I mean, I'm an ODR doctor, so I love CAT scans and MRIs because I can see a lot. I can see blood. I can see bleeds. I can see all those things. But it doesn't show you, just because you see it on the MRI doesn't mean that area of the brain is working. So your whole prefrontal cortex will show up on an MRI, but then you can do a SPECT scan if you have prefrontal de dementia and none of the prefrontal cortex will show up on the SPECT scan. It looks very, it's very obvious. It's like also you got this and there's nothing in the front. It's like this football is missing on the very front side. The latter review is even more interesting when you see how far deep the prefrontal cortex can go. So MRI is structure, SPECT is function. Great, thank you. Next question, how different are the results from an EEG and SPECT scans for seizures? And in parallel with this question, can a patient benefit from getting a SPECT if they already have an EEG? So an EEG is shows you the electrical activity of the different places of the heart. Again, I'm an ear doc, so on our seizure patients, I'd want to know, you know, is it a temporal seizure, is it a frontal seizure, is it a basilar seizure? Where is the seizure coming from? That you're not going to see on a SPECT scan. It's not going to really identify always the locus because SPECT scans, what you see, especially in seizure patients, although you might see an area that's lit up, what you're going to see overall in general is an area that's not lit up because it's been tired out. And so you're going to have these vacuum spaces in the SPECT scan that so EEG is really more better for showing you the location of where the seizure is or has been. SPECT scan is going to show you the areas around it that are too highly engaged or uh, too uh, low engaged. So if you're going to ask me, what do I want for a seizure patient? First thing I want is an EEG because I want to know where the nidus is and what type of, you know, what type of seizure are we dealing with? That's not what the SPECT scan are going to show. But I also want an MRI because I want to know if there's a lesion there. So um all together, and I think SPECT scans do have a place in seizure patients because uh, I, it's one of the best places if you want to look for in, uh, an infectious or a toxic type of response on the brain. SPECT scans show that beautifully, and neither EEG or MRI will show that. And, and toxins do cause a significant number of seizures, and that's increasing every year now. Thank you. I have one final question before we open this up to live questions. How does plasma donation compare to TPE? So plasma donation, you're going to go in and they're going to put an IV in you. They're going to take out your blood. And in the end run, they're taking out about 500 or anywhere between 500 and 750 of plasma. And you walk out the door and you're done. 
Plasma exchange is different because I'm removing a whole lot more. I'm removing four times that volume, anywhere from 250, uh, 2,500 to 3,500 all at once, and I'm replacing it with albumin. Now, there are some people in the industry that think the albumin actually has a role in the repair and the improvement of the toxic screen and of what it's doing on longevity markers. I'm not so sure I can buy that argument yet. But there are that there is that part of it as well that's different than plasma donation because we are giving you back albumin. I think it's really just more of a volume, but it's also the volume at once. If you went in, if you're trying to get toxins out of you and you're doing it through plasma donation, it's going to be difficult because you have to remove a substantial amount of the debris every time. Um, if you're doing it 500 at a time, you'd have to do at least six plasma donations to equal one plasma change. And then you have to keep doing it and you're you're never quite getting deep enough because I would say if you take a bathtub and you just take out a bucket and throw it out and then it fills back up over the bucket, you take it, throw it out. The dilution factor is too slow. If you got a bathtub and I'm taking two thirds of it out and then replacing it with water and doing it again, I'm going to get the, you're going to get there faster over time. Um, I do believe that plasma donations may have a role in maintaining toxin-free people after they've had the procedure to remove them, but we're in the process of looking at that. Thank you, Dr. Savage. We're going to open this up. Donna, I believe you have some questions in New York, so we're going to open this up live right now. Toxin determination, toxin testing, everybody should do. Period. End of story. I, if your kid's 14, you should be doing toxin testing on that. There is, a, I mean, the CDC came out yesterday, just yesterday, telling doctors they should be testing for forever chemicals, PFAs, because of the danger they pose to everyone. But they also say in there, there's no effective way to remove PFAs. Well, that's not true anymore. Our, our research has shown that. But the other thing is, when you start looking at the Wall Street Journal came out with an article last week that talked about the increase in colorectal cancer and breast cancer in younger people. And now the United States Preventative Task Force has moved colonoscopy down from 50 to 45 and mammograms down from 45 to 40. That hasn't happened in my, my career. That's the first time that that's ever happened. That means the U.S. government moved on it. It's significant. But the article in the Wall Street Journal said, we don't know why. But when you look at the graphs, it's very obvious. And it just has to do with the rate of toxic increase since the 1980s to today and the group of people they're looking at because they looked at people 80 years old. They said, well, we really didn't start to see them until they were about 60, the colon cancers. But it's interesting. Then you look at the 60-year-olds and we started seeing them in their late 40s, early 50s. Then we look at the 40-year-olds and now we're seeing them in their 40s and uh, 40s and 45. And now these young, it's, folks, it's, it just depends on how much toxin that you've been exposed to because the amount of toxins in the environment in 1980 was very low. The amount of toxins in 2020 is incredibly high. And now you have these 40-year-olds who were born in 1980 at a level of toxin they were born into, which was significantly higher than the 60 and the 80-year-old. And to sit there and go, why are all these people in this young category getting these cancers so quickly at earlier age? It's because they're so toxic at early age. So what tests should people be doing? I really believe in inflammatory markers. I really believe in oxidative markers. I think those are critical. I really believe in the immune system marker, as I told you before, uh, with the T, the B, and the natural killer cells. They tell a story that once you learn how to read them, there it's magic. But the toxin testing is is the gold standard. You you need to know where these levels are, and these levels are by the government levels of NHANES. And I've got to repeat that's the levels I reported all these toxins. If we went through the levels that every health and wellness doctor says that we should have in us, which is basically zero. It's incredible on how much um, they're letting these toxic MEHOP, which is a volatile chemical, the government approves 3,000 micrograms per, per milliliter, which is insane. But that's what they do. The urine test is going to win every day um, because urine concentrates the toxins in the urine. So you get a better concentrated sample. The blood doesn't do that. So it doesn't detect it nearly as quickly as the urine does. Secondary thing is urine's easy to do at home. You don't have to get people into an office to get a blood draw. So that's another pro for it. You can buy different aspects of the urine test. The full panel with everything I mentioned, all 109, is about $625 from Vibrant Health. 
you take off the PAs, PFAs, which you shouldn't, but if you did, you're down to 480. If you took off the mycotoxins, you're down to 250. If you took just the heavy metals, you're at $99. So every day of the week, it's going to be um, toxin testing from whatever panel. The ones I, I mean, I'm really passionate about is the heavy metals. We need to know what those levels are. Um, I would say the second most important thing is the PFAs. The third most important thing would be the environmentals, but all three of those kind of come together as really super important. The mycotoxins, also critical, also very important. Um, we've been exposed to those for years, but the problem is we're getting exposed to more of those because we now have housing and stuff that builds these molds that we live in, and we never used to have that kind of exposure over time. But um, it's, the, it's the urine test. Uh, I also do recommend the MSA um, per person, and I give them 20 milligrams per kilogram as a as a provocative dose or a 70 kilo guy. I'm going to give, um, give 1,500 milligrams of DMSA. You can pick that up from your local compounding pharmacy for about six bucks. And no, it's not covered by insurance, by any oh, insurance. Sorry. Apologize, at another all. question. I win, it should be with this danger. Maybe that will change, but right now it's cash. <laughs>
and, or the chemicals that we're in, but mostly it's the chemicals that we are eating. Um, so yeah, I mean, the answer is absolutely. I'm seeing just tons of this, but here, here's the thing that bothers me the most. Six years ago, only 80% of people, which is a big number, had toxins. In Chicago this year, that number was 100. There was, we didn't test a single person who didn't have at least three toxins and one of those in the high critical range. Um, every toxin down. every toxin causes cancer. What I mean by that is I'm a mathematician, I'm a statistician. So it's not linear. It's not like, look what okra toxin does. Look what PFA, uh, PF, uh, HXD does. Look what uh, lead does. You're look, it's kind of like, I say, oh, we talk about vitamin uh, chemistry on enzymes. Enzymes need a whole assortment of different vitamins for them to work properly. Similarly, a whole bunch of toxins of different ones can bind up that uh, bind up that enzyme in different ways and complicate that problem significantly. So we need to stop looking at PFA as only being the only thing. It's the accumulation of all of these eighty three thousand toxins working on an individual at once. In Chicago, the top leading ones by far was glass of gly glyphosate, which is an oxidative agent. That's what it does, just cause oxidative damage. There goes your DNA. And then you have BPA, which is number three, which is a xenoestrogen, which promotes growth of cancer. So you see where I'm going with this. There, it's, it's the accumulation of all these different toxins. I don't think that because of the studies that are coming out showing all the increase of cancer in young people, that it's inevitable that we realize that we're causing this problem. And so that's a great question. The answer is not quite going there because that makes some promises and things that from a legal point of view, we don't want to make. Uh, we can't make. I mean, it's, 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 we're in our early stages of looking at other things. My whole goal here of coming out of retirement and doing this because I knew the people who I needed to know. Um, I'm very good at marketing. I'm very good at uh, software. I'm very good at algorithms. I'm very good at studies. I could bring in a bunch of different people because I really wanted to start looking at what it is that the toxins are doing and what, when we get them out, do we see reverse? Now, with that being said and done, yes, I do believe that removing the toxins in anybody with any kind of chronic disease is going to do nothing but help them because we all know chronic disease is an inflammatory oxidative process over time. And you got to ask the question, but what's causing the oxidation and the inflammation? In my realm, and my goal, it's nutrient deficiencies, microbiome dysfunction, and as well as toxins. You go to our website, there's a 12 causes of aging, or you can call it the 12 causes of disease. Look at any of them, it's how they combine together. Are, am I seeing progression, uh, reversal of different things? I'm not gonna answer that question. I'll let my patient testimonies, testimonials answer that as well. What I can tell you, and it's mirroring what the Griswold study showed in the AMBAR study, is we're seeing a halt in the progression of the disease. It's important to realize that I believe most of the chronic diseases cause damage to an organ over time. And although we can stop that damage from going on by neutralizing the agent that the body is going after, I can't repair the body. That's up to the body to do. And now if the body can do it, and if you're giving it the nutrients back and the ways that you can do it so it can do it, then that's great. But that's not been the goal or the focus of um, our program or our research. I haven't done anybody with hemochromocytoma, but that's been in TPE world for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And that's one of the ways they get iron out of people is by doing plasma exchange. So there, I, there's no, it's not a contraindication. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the therapies for hemochromocytoma. And, you know, we use a lot of different vendors. Um, you know, one of the nice things is having built Power to Practice, which was the integrated world's largest software. And we had 45,000 different nutrients in the software. And I can tell you the 15% that worked well and the 85% that were just trash. Um, and so, but nice thing about charcoal is charcoal's charcoal and it's pretty hard. So we use Solar Ray. Uh, I like Quicksilver uh, on their charcoal product. Uh, it really is more about the consistency for the patients liking and doing it um, than the charcoal itself. Um, so I really, we haven't really seen any major differences in the extraction of the uh, mold binders or the molds with the binding of the charcoal or the heavy metals. Uh, charcoal seems to be charcoal in that case. I don't say that a lot about the things like magnesium. It's not magnesium, it's magnesium. It depends on what you put it with. Uh, same thing, you know, there's like with iron, it depends on what type of iron you take. Uh, but charcoal is one of those ones that kind of seems to be relatively neutral 
and you just need to get a good, consistent product with good, with good um, consistency to it. Thank you so much again, Dr. Paul, and for all of you for being here. We're so thrilled that you can join. We will be sending out a recording from today's symposium, along with some of the links that were shared in the chat. We thank you so much for anything and follow-up that we can respond and answer. Um, if you would like to find out a little bit more about some of the research, resources, in follow-up, I've also put into the chat the contact information for some of our team here at Damon Clinics, and Dr. Paul's information also is available. We ask you as well, save the date for our next quarterly symposium, which will be in April of 2024. Also looking ahead, something very special is we are planning at the end of this year, ideally to set up a SPECT symposium, which will be a multi-day symposium coming back again, likely in our Costa Mesa area, um, close to our headquarters. So we welcome sharing more details about CEUs, CMEs, and planning for that. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.